I'm Jumi Shin, and I'm a professor at the University of Toronto in chemistry. And I design and engineer proteins because I figure that nature has utilized and developed and evolved proteins for millions and billions of years. And so I figured this is a good template to work with. Okay, truthfully, I'm looking at this from a scholarly aspect. I, I, I want to study how proteins recognize ligands, in particular DNA. I've always been interested in protein DNA, these, these large biomolecules, biopolymers. And with the, the idea of developing therapeutics, mostly it had to do with doing, when you do protein design, you got to go with what's in the literature. So when people publish and work on proteins and do crystal structures or NMR structures, they're doing them often on something that's health related. And so because of the difficulties with doing protein design, we got to go with things that have high resolution structures. So normally I start with that. And so they tend to be health related. A lot of times proteins will be multimers, like a dimer, maybe a tetramer. And one reason for that it's kind of interesting you think about the DNA in your genome. If you've got a protein and it only has a gene of this big, let's say, and, but if you express it twice as a dimer, it could potentially cover and act like a protein that's maybe double the size, for example. So then you don't have as big a genome that you have to have in every cell. So I think the interesting thing was when people were doing the sequencing of the human genome some years ago, they thought, wow, if, if, um, if, if, if yeast have 20,000 base pairs, uh, 20,000 genes, then humans would have to have at least 100,000. And it turned out to be the other way around. So, uh, sorry, humans actually have 20,000 genes and yeast have more like, they have more which is interesting to think about, that they have their, their storage of their genome is less efficient in a way, if you think about it, than the human is, and yet we're a much more complicated organism. So one of the things about challenges is that sometimes you have to make and develop your own assays or techniques or methodologies in order to solve the problem. Because we're looking at trying a sol problem solving approach and because of the problem solving approach, there sometimes aren't approaches to help you solve that problem. There's someone out there? So, okay, so, so, so it, the difficulty would be actually in a way, we have to be very interdisciplinary, and now I think the words are multidisciplinary or transdisciplinary, about how you have uh, used different types of, of science, not just chemistry even, but to develop various assays. Really, it also has to do again with the fact that they're so health-related. And turns out that both of them, target the same DNA sequence. It's a sequence called the E-box, which is C-A-C-G-T-G. -G. And of course, that's gonna show up many times in your genome, but that E-box sequence does, uh, does, is involved with regulation, both in, in MYC, uh, MAX, and cancer, but also it turned out with regulating PAI1, which is uh, upregulated in a number of types of asthma. Asthma, the more I read about it, the more heterogeneous it is. It's a very unusual type of disease. It, it, the, the term asthma encompasses many different diseases, but it turns out that a lot of those people do have um, uh, the, the PAI1 upregulated in their, in their disease. And because of the industrialization that's occurred over the last 150 or so years, you have a lot of this that's environmental as well. So it gets, it gets, it gets aggravated, the disease gets aggravated because of pollution, contaminants, environmental types. So one of the things about design is we often want to look at some sort of a high resolution structure but there may or may, or may not be one. And also those, those are snapshots. 
It's a static snapshot of a very dynamic molecule. And so one of the things we're trying to do is if we can allow the, the proteins to evolve in their more dynamic type of liquid environment in the cell, would they, would they find different mutations that we wouldn't necessarily design in? And in fact, we have found some mutations that in a million years, I would never have thought, never have thought, wow, why would that work? So, so I like the idea of, of coupling the rational and the non-rational together. So, so because of that, I think you can get the best of both worlds. But by doing that, it's also very transdisciplinary because the techniques in both areas are very different. As someone who wants to be a scholar and to contribute to our knowledge and understanding, what, what I really started off with, and I think this is where I'd still say, is that I really wanted to understand how nature works. Why did nature develop this way? Of course, could have, you know, you couldn't think about Star Trek and, and evolution in a different universe and get a very different answer. But still, this is a viable answer, the, the, what we got in this world. So what I would like to do is understand how the evolutionary process got us to where we are at this molecular level. On, on a more, um, in a way, local level, I'd say, like how it impacts my community, people I know, for example. If we can develop some sort of drug that would help people, that would be wonderful, I think. Um, I, just because I know that my mom was just diagnosed, for example, with cancer, so, would it be possible to find some sort of a drug that would help people with disease? And that, that would be, to me, a really wonderful offshoot.